So once again, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. So, one of the questions that often gets asked when we're reading Genesis, when we're reading Torah, but particularly this Parsha, people always like to say, is the Torah true? Did it really happen this way? Are the things that the Torah talks about things that actually unfolded in history? And my friends, I have some great news for you. When it comes to this week's Torah portion, when it comes to the flood, that I can say to you that without a doubt that I have proof uh, that there was a flood. There was a flood. Absolutely no doubt about it, there is proof. Archaeological evidence will tell you, if you look at the bottom of the Mediterranean, it was not always wet. That what they have found in and around the Mediterranean, as they have done archaeological digs and studies and investigations, is they found that there were civilizations that were there. There were cities, there were towns, there were fields, that the land had been developed. And then guess what happened? There was a flood. So, at least when it comes to the flood, we can actually say the Torah is telling us exactly what happened. Sort of. Sort of. Because while there may have been a flood, of that there can be no doubt, there was a disastrous turn of events, a disastrous cycle of nature that brought in the waters and flooded out a large portion of the Mediterranean basin. That doesn't mean that there was an ark. That doesn't mean that there was a man named Noah who built said ark and gathered all the animals in two by two to that ark. That's not what it means at all. When we say that the Torah is true when it talks about the flood, it means that it happened. But I would like to share with you today in comparing and really coming to understand what I think is the most straightforward meaning of the Torah in this week's Torah portion, I'd like to share with you another truth that the Torah tells. Another truth that helps us in terms of how we approach our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. A truth that I believe to be the core of what the Torah is trying to get at in this narrative, in this story about the flood. But to appreciate the truth, we have to understand we have to understand that in human history, there is not but one telling of the flood, but in fact, there are several. There are several different stories about what happened from several different civilizations and cultures as they began to try to understand what this natural disaster meant. And in the telling of their stories, as compared to the Torah, we come to, as I said, a very deep understanding about our sacred literature and about this sacred story. The other narrative that I'm referring to is actually really, a, in a sense, a, a combination of a number of different narratives. It is referred to as the Gilgamesh epic. The Gilgamesh epic is one of the oldest surviving pieces of literature in existence. It was written, give or take, around sometime in the 18th century BCE, before the Common Era, which roughly makes this text, uh, you know, give or take, about 4,000 years old. Now, that text combined with another epic known as Atrahasis, the Epic of Atrahasis, gives us insight into the Sumerian and Babylonian culture at the time. And their narrative of the flood explains how they looked at this natural disaster that unfolded. And it is fascinating. Well, well, at least I found it fascinating. And I hope you do too. Because the way they look at the flood is this. The Gilgamesh epic begins about, it's the story about a king. It's actually like 10 or 12 tablets that are surviving. right? And it tells the story about this amazing king. And this is a king who has a number of different adventures. And in one of his adventures, he wants to find how to live eternal life. 
and he is told that there is a man named Utmapashtim, which if memory serves, I think means one who sees far away. Utmapashtim. And he is someone who the gods have blessed with living forever. And so Gilgamesh goes and seeks him out to find out how it is to hear his story about how he lived forever. And this is what Utmapashtim tells him. Tells him that the generation of the gods that were first created gave rise to, soon after, another generation of gods, the younger gods, and that these younger gods came forward and said, you know something? We don't like doing all this work for our food because in this culture, the gods ate. We don't like doing all this work for our foods. We need to create some being that will serve us and feed us. And then according, therefore, to this version of history, this version of development, humanity was created. The gods created humanity, and humanity was to work to provide food for the gods. In other words, according to this version of the creation of the world and creation of humanity, human beings and the world itself are like one huge plantation. And humans are serfs who serve on the plantation to feed the gods. The story then unfolds, though, and says that these humans became really quite numerous and very noisy. And that their noise, they were so rambunctious, they disturbed the gods. And so the gods said, really? This is like having a teenager. Okay, so they didn't quite say that. But the gods looked upon this noisy, rambunctious thing they created, and they said, oh my gosh, they're disturbing our sleep. Let us wipe them out. And that's what they did. And guess how they chose to wipe them out? What was the manifestation of the gods' power in that time? Was to bring water. And so according to this narrative, the gods brought a flood. But one god was smart enough to realize that if they destroyed all humanity, there would be a problem. And he went and warned Utnapashtim. And he told Utnapashtim, according to the narrative as it exists and as it survived, to build an ark. And that he would be able to survive out the flood with his family on the ark. And sure enough, he built an ark. And sure enough, the waters came. And after the waters receded, he came out of the ark and offered up a sacrifice. And when the gods smelled the sacrifice, they came swarming around. Why? because they realized that without human beings, they had no food. And in honor of Utnapashtim, in honor of his feeding the gods, he was granted life eternal. That is the story as it survives through the Gilgamesh epic, as also amended and added on to by the epic of, Ahat, of Atrahasis. This is an epic that goes back, as I said, thousands of years. Now think about the story, think about the narrative as we have it in the Torah. God creates humanity, not because God needs, not because God needs humanity to serve God, but God creates humanity as the pinnacle of creation, the very last thing created on the sixth day of creation. And why does God bring the flood? It's not because humanity is annoying God. It's not because humanity is bothersome or boisterous, right? Why does God bring the flood? Because humanity, in the words of the Torah, has corrupted the way of the earth. Note, it doesn't actually even tell us what that corruption is. And it uses a word that really we have no idea exactly what it means in context. Because quite honestly, the exact sin is irrelevant. What matters is that their deeds were such that it corrupted the way of the earth. And therefore, in our narrative, in the Torah, God brings the flood. And similar to the other narrative, Noah builds an ark. Noah builds an ark. And similar to the other narrative, after the flood, Noah comes off the ark and also offers up a sacrifice. But our God, in our narrative, does not swarm around the sacrifice because God is hungry. But God embraces the sacrifices and makes a promise to Noah. Not for life eternal just for Noah as some kind of reward, but
but to never bring such destruction to humanity and to the earth ever again. So yes, there was a flood. And what we see here with these two tellings, these two narratives, are different ways that cultures look at that flood and therefore give us insight into how they understand themselves. When we look at the narrative of Gilgamesh, we see that the Babylonian gods are relatively indifferent to humanity. They're an afterthought in the process of creation who become a nuisance because even though they do a job, provide food, they've now become such a pain that the gods are like, yeah, whatever. But in the Torah, as I said, it's very different. In the Torah, we are the pinnacle of creation. The Torah understands that humanity is important, that we matter, and that what we do on this earth makes a difference to the very course of the earth itself. We are significant in the Torah, whereas we are irrelevant in the other narrative. And what does that mean? What does it mean to have our sacred literature tell us that we are important? It means that we have to accept responsibility. We have to responsibility for our actions, for our deeds upon this earth. When we look at the narrative, when we look at the flood story, and we focus on it, oftentimes we focus on the punishment, and we think to ourselves, boy, either that is one very angry God, or humanity really stinks. And you'll see in most children's books, they'll make a one-line passing reference to that element of it, and then boom, go into the story of the ark and the animals coming in two by two, and isn't that sweet, and isn't that lovely, and then everyone was saved. But that misses the point. With the Babylonian version in mind, we can and should read this story differently. This story is, it seems to me, somewhat parallel to how parents ideally should deal with their children. When we are children and we are growing up, I think most all of us have had that moment where our parents have done something, have had to punish us or reprimand us or spoke perhaps harshly to us. And we have said to ourselves, when we are parents, we will never do that to our children. And then what happens? We become parents. And we realize that that punishment, that punishment was not done because our parents were angry people. And that punishment was not delivered to us because we stink. But on the contrary, when our parents would punish us, would reprimand us, that was not an act of anger or hate. On the contrary, that was a sign of love. The flood narrative, the flood story, through all of its destruction, if only we focus on that, we miss the bigger point. And the bigger point is this, God loves humanity. If God didn't love humanity, then God wouldn't have cared. God would be like those Babylonian gods who did not care. But the God of the Torah cares. And in caring for us, the God of Torah believes in us. And that is the Torah's core message in this parsha: is the belief that humanity matters. And that is an incredible gift that the Torah gives. Because the belief that we matter elevates us. It raises us up. The belief that we matter imbues us with a sense of purpose about what we can do in this world. The belief that we are significant and are of concern to the divine can make life meaningful. And it also should be humbling. Because to realize that our deeds matter is to accept, as I said, the responsibility for those actions, for the power that we have. And with that power comes the sense of how much we all have to work on living a responsible life. And the humility is required to see that we just 
don't always make that. We don't always hit that mark. In this week's Torah portion, the Torah asserts a truth in which the Torah believes. But it is not the truth about whether or not there was an ark and there was Noah and there were the animals two by two. That's not the real truth the Torah is getting at. On the contrary, the truth that the Torah believes is that we matter. That what we do when we interact with one another as individuals in a community and in our world and how we treat our world, that that is significant and makes a difference. The Torah believes in this truth. It believes in the truth that we matter. And therefore, the Parsha leaves us with a question. The Torah believes in that truth, but do we? Do we believe that we matter and can make a difference? And if so, are we willing to act on that reality? Shabbat Shalom, everyone.